Hello and welcome to my March reviews video. I have nine books for you this month. Half of them are audiobooks, only a third of fiction, which is unexpected. Uh, but yeah, let's get going. The first book I have for you is The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Harcastle by Stuart Turton. It's also published in the US under Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Harcastle, because like America. Evelyn? Evelyn? Evelyn it sounds right to me. I heard this book before and thought the premise sounded interesting but like not enough to pick up and then I was in uh, Burley Fisher Books in Haggerston, one of my favourite bookshops, and I found this there and I realised it has a typo on the back. It says like Aidan Bishop is too late to save her and there's no space between the two and the late and I was like I've got to buy it, I need to have that copy with that typo. It was serendipity that made me want to buy this book. So it's it's kind of like an Agatha Christie novel, like they're all, it's like a whole bunch of different people gathering in this old country house for a party. Um, and then there's a murder, surprisingly. Um, and so our main guy, Aiden, he wakes up uh, and he's he doesn't know who he is, like he's in someone else's body and it's really confusing. Uh, and eventually comes to pass that he has eight days where he relives the same day over and over again but as a different character inside of the book and he has to solve the murder by the end of the eight days to get out of this loop otherwise he loses his memory and has to start again at the, the first of the eight days. Um, so premise, really cool! And when it was about 100 pages in I was getting really into it because it's like he realised he had these future bodies um, that and they could kind of collude together even though they're all him, they're him in the future and in the past um, and I was I was so into that but it got like very convoluted it was the kind of book that you had to read really quickly because in order to enjoy it you had to remember all of the names of everyone and where everyone was at all these different times which is quite very well very confusing unless you're reading it like at a staggering pace which is what I decided to do. It does have like a map in the front of the house and everyone's room in it and it also has it lists all of the guests at the party, so you can always go back and reference them, but it's still, there's a, there's a lot to remember. And I would have loved it if it stuck with that, but it got really, like there was, there were, there were too many elements to it besides it just being a murder mystery. One point that he changes, he manages to change the future of the day, and I just fundamentally disagree with that because if we're in, you can, you can do time travel two ways. You can do time travel where everything in the past affects how it goes in the future and you, then you may not survive and you know you can really fuck things up or it's like this all this is the way it has always happened and no matter what you're going to end up doing things that cause it to do the thing that's always happened and there is a point in this where he like changes the story and I just really disagree with that also there was this whole like black mirror white bear thing going on I don't want to describe it and ruin it but there, there's just there's a lot of elements and there's also this crazy so it's not just Aiden our main dude who is trying to solve this murder there's also this girl Anna who is like a friend of Aiden but then there's also this butler is it the butler I think it's the butler who's just going around killing people and it's very vicious and it's just a lot I think this was really yeah fun premise too much happened for me <laughs> The second book I have is an audiobook and that is called Red Rising by Pierce Brown. This came out in 2014, it's part of a series. I think there are four in the series and I think they're all out or three of them are out. There are three? I don't know. This is a future in which we are colonising Mars uh, but everyone, like the social classes are based on colour. So red is like the bottom of the heap and they spend all their time mining or mining something to be able to terraform Mars and make it habitable. Um, and then there are kind of like different class levels and the top are like the gold that kind of control this whole, you know, dystopian system. So Darrow is aggrieved for some reason and decides to like, he is forced into this thing where he's going to kind of overthrow the golds from within. Uh, it's very, it literally is Hunger Games and that's the thing that really annoyed me about it. I thought it would be like a really interesting political thriller where like you start out and it was really, I really enjoyed the start, you got like really gritty and like then something terrible happens and you realise the whole system is against you and then you go like kill it but that happens and then he gets this like transformation into being like a fake gold and goes into this academy where all of the best young golds fight it out to become like ultimate god, I don't, I don't remember um, but I just kind of expected it to be the thing and not have the majority of the book be like he's with these other young people in teams on this terrain and they're like fighting each other to the death pretty much like it is Hunger Games and it also really annoyed me that this guy Darrow is just like ultimately skilled at everything and it made me think about how like there's this gender divide and these kind of like 
young dystopian things where like one person comes up and it has to you know fix everything um and it's that like the the when it's a male character it, they always seem to be they never have any doubt and they're always they always just like have the skills so like in red rising and in ender's game but if it's a woman like in divergent or the hunger games they're always like not they're kind of like thrust into the situation that they don't want to be in and oh it just really bugs me and i'm kind of over it i've just read i've read enough of those books i didn't need another one i thought this was something different uh so yeah i'm not gonna I'm not gonna read the sequel the third book i have for you is notes on nervous planet by matt haig um this came out last year and came out i think the other week in paperback which is why i own it um so this is about try it's non-fiction and it's about kind of navigating the world uh the like digital culture without uh you know it damaging your mental health so matt haig talks about how he'd had like a nervous breakdown has a lot of panic attacks um and how that kind of increasingly has been related to having this complete interconnectedness of like the social internet um and how he's found like coping strategies to deal with that and it was really sweet but I just feel like I'm over this problem. I don't like it how he describes everybody as like these social media drones and we're all like, we can't get off Instagram and you're obviously like, everyone has this complex about thinking that everyone's having loads of fun all the time and they're not and their life is boring when like the solution is that you have to realize that people only put the best things about them online. And I'm like, yeah, obviously. I just, I feel like this doesn't acknowledge that there is a way to navigate the space outside of it. You know, instead of, instead of being like, we have the social internet here's how we can like deal with it to to like you know deal with it healthily when actually you can just kind of check out of the social internet and pick the bits that are right for you in the first place which is just something that wasn't addressed i do think that someone that does struggle with um you know their mental health in relation to being like hyper connected all the time that they would really enjoy this and i actually bought a copy and sent it to my friend anna because i just feel like it would be really up her street not because she has problems just <laughs> but just because it's like really fun and light-hearted and also if you are kind of deep in that world and you have to be for whatever reason you know this is some interesting takes on on those issues so it's formatted in a bunch of like really small chapters and there's this one that i really like that's quite different to anything else but i just want to read it to you it's called a note from the beach hello i am the beach I'm created by waves and currents. I'm made of eroded rocks. I exist next to the sea. I've been around for millions of years. I was around at the dawn of time itself and I have something to tell you. I don't care about your body. I'm a beach. I literally don't give a fuck. I'm entirely indifferent to your body mass index. I'm not impressed that your abdominal mus muscles are visible to the naked eye. I am oblivious. And it goes on and it ends in just be, just beach. So yeah, cute book, just not necessarily for me. The next book is also an audiobook, and that is Invisible Women Exposing the Data Bias in a World Designed for Men by Caroline Criado Perez. Uh, this came out this month. I think I read it, like, listened to it the day or the day after it came out. And this is basically what it says on the cover. It's talking about all of these different ways where the world is designed for men. Anything from, like, how seatbelts are designed for male bodies to so many drugs aren't tested for women because they think they would have like for pregnancy or whatever because they might have adverse effects so they don't test it on women when women actually use it and then get all of these adverse effects this was very informative and very interesting i think i heard about it on a podcast she i will leave a link to at least one maybe two podcasts <laughs> this has been mentioned to uh below but yeah i i feel like i was already super sold on this like nothing none of the content shocked me uh because i i have no shock left for how the world is designed for men um but very informative and i think it's kind of making people realize that this is an issue more and not just in how much people get paid but in how like physical items are designed and medication etc i did really like how it uses the term the gender data gap to describe all of these different areas of the world and historically how we've made things where women haven't been taken into account and i think that's going to be like a big buzzword for 2019 gender data gap next book i have is just a gem uh this is with the end of mind by katherine mannix uh i heard about this on you mean the big c which is a podcast i think i recommended in my last video um and yeah katherine mannix is a palliative care nurse so she works in a hospice as a as a like licensed physician uh but mostly dealing with the end of life and how people die and talking to you know families and the patients about the process of dying and also trying to uh, make the 
the end of life as comfortable as possible and dealing with um, kind of managing symptoms. This was really fantastic. Um, it contains a multitude of stories. Every kind of like maybe 20, 25 pages is a new patient uh, where she talks about the, the difficulty they had. So um, someone where they're, they're so in denial about them dying that their family can't talk to them about their decisions at the end of life um, to, you know, people being really afraid of death and that's <laughs> denial and fear of different things. Um, but, you know, also all these different kind of family dynamics that uh, make these these kind of situations harder. Um, and I found it really comforting to hear her describe the process of the end of life. Um, I've never seen someone die. Uh, I, and I've never, yeah, very been, I've never even like been in a hospital near a, near a dying person besides when I was young, I guess. Um, but just hearing like how you kind of, you just like s slowly over the like weeks before you um, you finally die you kind of are s sleeping more and being awake less and eventually like it's very calm and you breathe out and you just don't breathe in again. Death is a very taboo subject um, and I've talked about this on this channel before because I've read a couple of books about death uh, and I think this is like part of a wave of us demystifying um, a lot of a lot of those kind of things so and also I can although I, I don't have any like death things happening in my life at the moment uh, I can see how this would be really really comforting if you uh, you know someone around you is, is reaching the end of their life um, and also just now I feel equipped to handle a lot of those kind of situations and yeah really really great it's like I I um, was reviewing this on Goodreads, like I marked it as read and said I was X amount of pages in, uh, and the author on Twitter was like, how many times have you cried so far? And I was like, a lot, <laughs> a lot. It makes you cry a lot, but not like in a sad way, but also in a kind of heartwarming, comforting way. And although I say that death isn't part of my life, I'm actually going to, I'm starting on Monday working at a will writing company and uh, they, I joined their Slack and one of the books they had in their books channel was like, oh, I'm reading this now. And I was like, oh my God, me too. Um, so I, I'm going to the right place where I can get more recommendations for books about death, which I'm looking forward to. The next book I have is the book that explains why at the start of this, I said I had nine books and half of them were audiobooks um, because I bought this book the day it came out. This is Bad Blood by John Carriayou. Carriayou? That's what I'm going with. Um, and it came out in paperback last week. I had to buy it for a book club and, um, and I bought it and I read like 50 pages of it and then I was like, oh, this is too slow for me. Because I've already listened to the whole podcast. There's a podcast about the same thing called The Dropout. There's also an HBO documentary being released soon. Is it already released? Called The Inventor. Um, so I was just like, I need to speed through this a bit faster. I'm going to get the audiobook. So Bad Blood is about the demise of a medical technology company called Theranos and its founder, Elizabeth Holmes. It's a little note, that podcast was really good, but I really hate how it was called The Dropout because that's just not relevant. Like, I don't think that her having left university to start this company is just like not her most important feature at all. And I, I think even the inventor isn't quite right because she didn't really, she basically, um, I'm doing that thing where you talk about something loads before you get to the meat of what you're actually saying. So Theranos was a company that Elizabeth Holmes left university to found and it was about kind of m micro sizing a lot of blood testing. So she envisioned that you could have like a patch on your arm that with micro needles um, like reads information from your blood and then accordingly gives you the right quantities of your medication. Uh, and then over time, this that, like she realized that was impossible and made kind of like a small machine thing that in theory you could have in your home and you would just have to pick, prick your finger and just have a drop of blood instead of it being like an intravenous, a, ven a venous, just a venous, <laughs> like a, uh, taking blood from your veins, um, which is how like so many blood tests have to happen. And like over time, but she basically like lied to a lot of people and said that everything was fine and it was working fine. So the author found out that this was going on uh, and had, hadn't been uncovered by that point at all. And he started talking to some people that had left the company and they were under like really strict non-disclosure agreements and there was a lot of kind of legal fights. And he broke the story with a big article in the Wall Street Journal and uh, eventually he made it into a book and now there's like so much other information about it. Um, it's an interesting story, 
for sure. I think it's one of those, it's becoming a bit of a thing. Like how the last couple of years, like true crime has really been like what the people want. Now with like the fire festival thing, this, people want the fraudsters. Like that's I think gonna be a really big thing. I'm trend forecasting at the moment. 2019 is all about the gender data gap and frauds. <laughs> it was very interesting and a lot more thorough than the podcast. Um, and I'm guessing that the podcast as well as the documentary won't be able to have a lot of information about how this scandal broke and the whistleblowers because that is kind of John like the author's property so that kind of element of it was exciting um so yeah if you're into fraud as everyone is in 2019 it's a book for you next we have another audiobook this is 21 lessons for the 21st century by Yuval Noah Harari um I read and reviewed his books Sapiens and Homo Deus last year um and less thrilled with this to be honest so this is Harari going through just like jumping through so many different things about the world at present from like politics to economics to environment to education like so many different elements and basically being kind of being like this is how we solve them but also like actually I don't know how to solve them and although I I read Sapiens and Homo Deus really appreciating the kind of context that he was offering um, I think in this because it's focused on the present it felt like it had more of an agenda. It did feel like he was coming from this left-wing perspective on on politics um, in a way that was is less trustworthy than because when he's talking about history and he is a like professor of history, uh, you can draw reasonable conclusions from these historical blah blah blah. Um, but this is it. Just seemed like the kind of book that someone could be like, this is like a whole solid objective fact. Uh, when I think it it's more subjective than his other work. Call me out if you disagree with me. Uh, but yeah, it just, it felt more like his opinion than it did like, this is how the world works. Although still definitely an enjoyable listen and interesting to, you know, get more context about the world, even if you should take it with a grain of salt. Next book I have is The Slow Regard of Silent Things by Patrick Rothfuss. This is a novella to go as part of his King Killer Chronicles uh, and it came out in 2014. Um, so this follows, if you don't, if you haven't read The Wise Ones of Fear or The Name of the Wind, then like this is just not going to be interesting to you. And I love that in, in the preface, he literally says that in the author's foreword, you might not want to buy that book. <laughs> if you haven't read any of my other books, you don't want to start here, which is fair. Um, I really enjoyed this. I didn't think, I thought I would just kind of like, I just wanted a, a bit of a palate cleanser for all this non-fiction I've been reading. Um, so I grabbed this from this lovely shop in, uh, what's it called? From Heifers in Cambridge, uh, which is a great shop. So this is a novella about Auri, who belongs in the, belongs, I mean, she can move, uh, but she lives in the, the under thing of the university. And she's quite an odd character in uh, King Killer Chronicles. She only knows uh, Quoth and Quoth has kind of like lured her out. So she's what is assumed to be like an ex-student who's gone a bit mad and now kind of just like lives in this space. Um, and there are like three reasons I really love this. So the first is that the, the, the under thing, this space that she lives in, I kind of imagined it to just be like, like a cellar and some hallways, but actually it's, it's like there's a whole castle of stuff underneath this, underneath this university, it's all completely abandoned. Like in, in the book she discovers this new room and it's like, really like a made up bedroom that's really like glamorous and stuff but has just been like abandoned for so many years and there are like these like this pool where she has to go like dive down through loads of pipes um and it's not overly descriptive of all of the actual environments but it is just kind of like it seems like an like an endless mysterious area of different rooms which is very cool um the second thing why did i say the three things when i only have two things <laughs> is that um Auri, like she, every everything has a place and also everything has a name. She always says, I'm going through this room, this room, this room, and names all of them without ever describing them. And eventually you, you sort of build up a slight mental picture. You kind of remember which rooms, which a bit, um, but everything, everything has a name, including all of her like objects and they all have a place. So she spends a lot of the time being like, oh, this is, and it's wrong, it's wrong there. And then she goes in her, like, and is really messed up and like tries to find all of the different ways that things can be positioned. And it's like, oh, I need to, I'm gonna move the sheet to there. And like, oh, you know, the, black, the blanket's happy there now. It's happy there. Everything's right with the world. I'm at peace. Um, but yeah, it just, she has this really interesting connection to objects in a way that the thing that I love about it is that it's, 
it seems both really sensible and kind of like she does have this this other this like heightened sense of, of all of the things around her but it also is mad and it just like runs this really fine line of you can you can go with how mad it is without thinking she's fully mental and also without thinking that everything she's saying is sensible and I really enjoyed that um I think she's a really interesting little character and this was very fun um I know that Rothfuss he's written a couple other novellas in this world um with other characters so I'd like to read more of them because I think his writing is just really good appreciate it a lot and the last book I have for you is another audiobook, and that is Hunger by Roxane Gay. Uh, this came out in 2017, and as soon as it came out I wanted to read it, although I hadn't read any of Roxane Gay's work. Um, I've always wanted to read Bad Feminist, and I know that she's just like renowned as being like a, a wise, interesting feminist woman. And the other day I just felt like listening to it, so I did. Um, so Hunger is a memoir, it's called A Memoir of Brackets My Body, I think, is the, the subtitle. And it's really about Gay's like connection to to her body as like a physical thing, um, and takes it through through her life. So she was uh, she was slim or like normal um, until she was twelve years old, where she was gang raped. Sorry, trigger warning. Um, gang raped by her her boyfriend and um, his friends, and she kind of is retrospectively talking about this age, I think forty five, and saying that like after that she chose to like eat loads and put on weight as a form of protection because if she made herself undesirable to men they wouldn't be able to hurt her um and this is the the start of her whole life having like really big problems with weight and that's the issue i just said problems and it's not a problem like in some ways in like some medical ways yes there are issues with being overweight and she's not just fat this isn't a per this isn't a person talking about like being self-conscious because they're fat. This is someone that is extremely obese. Um, I think she says at the start her heaviest was 650 pounds, which is 200 kilograms or something like that. That's like triple, quadruple my weight. So it's not just talking about her self-esteem, it's really talking about a lot of practical issues she has with like, you know, flying and moving and communicating with people. Um, and that's kind of one aspect of it, but a lot more of it is how people react to her as an extremely fat person. Um, and also how this kind of trauma in when she was young has influenced her, her like eating habits and her views about herself and her value um, and, and how that's related to her sex life and romantic life and stuff. Um, really just very powerful. She's both extremely fierce and very vulnerable and it's just, just so sincere um, that I thought it was fantastic. A really big topic in this book is fat phobia and how people view fat people obviously because this is something she's had to experience um, and I, I like definitely realise I'm part of that problem. I think I'd already known that I'm part of that problem in like a passive way as in I don't, it's not like I walk down the street and I'm like oh fatty <laughs> but equally um, when she's talking about how people kind of expect fat people to um, not be as accomplished, to not be able to do certain things uh, and also conversely don't think about how they can't do certain things and a lot of the problem is that when like you see a fat person you as in me thinks um, I don't really care that they're like I don't really care about their like physical bulk it doesn't like disgust me in any like way I, I'd be happy having like a really fat friend um that even that sounded really fat phobic I don't know I don't know what it is but it just it sounds really like I'm have disdain for it and it's no the thing that is I think the fundamental of it is that if I see someone that is just like extremely fat it looks like they don't have control of it it looks like they've tried and failed to be skinnier it's because that societally we should all be trying to be skinnier so a really fat person hasn't tried or has failed um and that's something that i think i like passively think a lot about a lot of people and um i don't want to like i'm gonna i'm gonna try and work on that um but yeah it really kind of like hit home some of the things she was saying this about about how it is it's like one of the most stigmatized and unacceptable things even oprah who you think is someone that is so confident in herself and has made a career out of being like a strong confident woman um 
even like she invested 40 million dollars in Weight Watchers, you know? Uh, and it's just like a final straw of something that we societally don't accept that people can be fat and happy and successful and 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 comfortable with with themselves yeah i feel like i've just gone on a bit of a, a rant now about fat phobia um it was fantastic and i would highly recommend that i'd like to read it actually because this is an audio as an audiobook and go through things too quickly and there isn't really time to kind of like stop and take it in so it's the kind of book that i will be rereading at some point in a physical form who knows um, whoa, whoa, lots of books, okay. I feel like this is an especially long video because I talked about each book for a long time, but that's what you're here for. Um, so anyway, uh, next month is April, that's happening soon, and then at the end of that you'll get another one of these. That's how this system works, is that I put up a video of what I've read in the month and then you expect that the following month I'm going to do the same thing. But I haven't read anything in April yet, because it's not even April yet. What am I saying? Alright, bye!